Let's take a moment to welcome all of our guests that are tuning in from around the world via Facebook Live and Trust Mace Church Live broadcast. Thank you for tuning in. Let's give it up for the great men and the beautiful women of our Correctional Facilities Partnerships tuning in. And to our guests here at TC521, thank you so much for bearing the elements of rain to be here. <laughs> Attendance drops about 15% when it, uh, when it rains, because I mean, I'm melting. No, I'm glad to see everybody. It's awesome, awesome, awesome. So, so we're continuing our series, uh, Who We Are. And this series was birthed out of some things that we did as a church staff. Please understand this. Church staff doesn't mean like we're employees of Transformation Church. This, this isn't a job for me. This is a calling. And so with our staff, we wanted to make sure that our staff was healthy because we can't lead you where we haven't been. Can you imagine having a tour guide going, hey, uh, we're going to go through these woods here. Do you know the way? Nah, first time for me too. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we, as your servant leaders, are embodying what it means to be followers of Jesus. And so for about a year, year and a half, we've, we've really uh, worked to develop a, a culture. Culture is a set of behaviors that not only allow you to survive, but to thrive. And so last week, we looked at humility. This week, we're going to look at teamwork. Uh, let me give you an illustration. So I was a, a young husband. Uh, Presley, my daughter, she's 23 now. She was a baby then. And I was just trying to figure out, like, what does it mean to be a dad? Um, I didn't have a dad example. I had men in my life, but, but I never got to see it, like, up close and personal. So I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. And one of the things that marriage teaches you is this, how selfish you are. I had no idea how much I was about me until it became we. And then you get this little alien thing called a human being. And you're like, man, I am selfish. Anyway, so I'm trying to figure this out. And uh, man, young moms, boy, that's tough. Who dads, that's why we got to help. See, I didn't know that. So one day, I'm seeing Vicky struggling, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do something. So I get down, and I don't even remember what I'm doing, but afterwards she goes, that's the kind of help that I need. Like, I need you to partner with me. I was like, yeah. <laughs> now, let me give an example when I didn't do that. So Presley had grown up a little bit. Jeremiah was a baby now, so you got two now. I'm out traveling and speaking. We started a ministry called One Heart at a Time. So I'm traveling, speaking. And the thing about a speaker is people tell you how awesome you are and it's great. And then you begin to believe that. And then you come back home and Vicky's hair was frazzled. Kids were over here. Presley had a butcher knife coming at her. I mean, it was like, you know, and I'm, I'm walking in on a spiritual high. You know, I've preached the gospel and then so like, I'm like, hello, family, father's here. The king has arrived. I'm tired now. I'm going to go upstairs and get on my little chase lounger and grab the sacred remote control and flip channels aimlessly. So I did that. And she came upstairs like, hot. I'm like, what's the problem? Like, you do you. I'm doing me. So like, we got into a tiff. Uh, no, it was an argument. And if you know anything about my wife, she ain't like, you know, uh-uh, she threw the javelin. So we called my mentor. He lives in Indianapolis. Called him up. I was like, Alan, yo, can you believe this? So I began to lay out the scenario, how I'm out preaching the gospel, and I'm, when I get home, I'm tired. And he listened, and he got quiet, and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, Dewey, uh, if you're preaching of the gospel makes you so tired that you can't love and serve your wife and kids, then you're not preaching the gospel. Like the gospel begins in the home of serving your wife and your kids. So when you get home and you feel tired, you open up the mailbox and you put your tiredness in the mailbox and you go serve your wife and kids. I was like, <laughs> okay. He was right. So, so, so in a marriage, and I know not everybody's married, but, but in a marriage, it's not 50-50, y'all. It's 100-100. It's not 50-50. It's not like, well, you do this and I do this. No, we're teammates. 
And, and so in our homes, teenagers, preteens, like you have a role to play too. Teenagers, you know how you do. Like your parents, they work really hard. They buy you like a Big Mac and fries and you're leaving a drive through and, 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 they, and then they, they say this horrible question, can I have a fry? And you're like, no, you can't have my fry that you just bought in the car that you drive me around in and the clothes that you bought from the house that I live in. Have any of us had teenagers do that yet? <laughs> teenagers, if you do that, raise your hands. Stop. It's teamwork. Like, like, seriously, like, at every level, in a family, in a church, at your job, at your school, teamwork literally makes the dream work. But, but we got to make sure we got the same dream, though. Well, I'm glad Jesus took care of the dreams. Jesus was asked a conversation, and a religious leader asked him, Jesus, what's most important? And he said this, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. The whole law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In other words, from Genesis to Revelation, the goal of the gospel is to shape a people who love God, who love themselves, and who love their neighbor. Let me pause here. The hardest aspect in upward, inward, outward is the inward part. Here, let me ask you a question. When you talk to yourself, do you talk to yourself as though you're speaking to someone you love? Probably the hardest, most critical person in your life is you. You probably beat yourself up more than anybody. Here's what you and I have got to come to grips with, and this will set us free. You, 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 you ready? Repeat with me. I, I am, am not, not good, enough. good enough. Jesus, Jesus is, is my, my good enough. Jesus is our good enough. On your best day, you're not good enough. On your worst day, I'm not good, good enough. But every day, Jesus goes, I'm your good enough. So what happens? Our eyes get off of self and get on him. Some of us are so into ourselves that you just beat yourself up constantly, perpetually. And then here's what you do. You begin to throw that on God. Well, the way I feel about me must be the way God feels about me. And God's, no, no, believe what I say about you, and that'll transform what it means for you. So when we begin to love ourselves, we begin to love other people. So that's the big dream, but how you express that dream is going to be unique. Some of you are going to teach school. Some of you are, are going to be athletes. Some of you are going to be entertainers. Some of you, I don't, I don't know. If you can fly planes, be a pilot. People ask me, Derwin, what should I do? I'm like, I don't know. But whatever it is, love God and love people through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know? If you're an engineer, go build something. But love God. Love people. You know? So, so there's a big dream. That's, that's quote, unquote, the big dream. And let me pause here uh, really quick before I move on. I'm not sure who this is for. But please understand this. Wherever you go, you take you with you. So you think, well, if I have a better job that'll help. If I had her better this, that'll help. Well, wherever you go to that better, what's in here is gonna take that better and diminish it. That's why Jesus talks about on the inside. So when we talk about loving ourselves correctly, that matters. So, so teamwork makes a dream work. And God's going, I have a dream for you. It's a dream of love. But I'm also gonna give you gifts and talents to be able to bring that dream to fruition in your families, in your spheres of influence. Every follower of Jesus, if you follow Jesus, every follower of Jesus has been given a grace gift by God the Holy Spirit for ministry. Every follower of Jesus has been given a grace gift for ministry. Now, ministry simply means this, to serve. That's all it means. Every follower of Jesus, you have a gift so that you can serve the world. 
There's no celebrities at Transformation Church other than Jesus. Me living and preaching this 40-minute message is not the sum total of my ministry. There are things that happen all around in relationship that you'll ne never see. And the same thing for you. So what I want you to understand is when you're at work, that's your ministry. For some of you, you want to change jobs. And God is going, I want to change your perspective. Do you think you're just here to get a paycheck? No, you're here to minister. And please, ministry doesn't mean you get a big old King James version of the Bible and go, turn or burn, sinners. <laughs> you know what it means? It means you're constantly praying. It means you're serving. It means you do your work with excellence. It doesn't mean you put a fish symbol on your business. It means that your business is conducted with excellence and honesty and not greed that you treat those who work for you with dignity as though you're working with Jesus himself. That's what makes something, quote unquote, Christian. All of us have ministry. Teenagers, you have a ministry at your school. And God has gifted you for that ministry to be expressed. Where do we get this from? The Bible. The Bible's a great book, y'all. It really is. Therefore, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Let me give you some background really quick. The Corinthian church, uh, Corinth was in Greece, and, and Corinth would have been like the Las Vegas of the day. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. People was wilding out. Uh, some, of, some of us as Americans are shocked by certain things. In the ancient world, it would have made America look like Disneyland. There were cultic uh, temples everywhere, and the way some of these pagans pleased their gods was through all types of sexual immorality. I mean, it was everywhere. It was thick in the atmosphere. And you know what Paul did to transform that? He taught people that Jesus is Lord. He wasn't like, man, if we can just get somebody on the Corinthian Supreme Court, we could really change things. You know, if, if we can get the right political leaders in place, we can really change things. No, he, he teaches them that Jesus is Lord. Watch this. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are different gifts but the same Spirit. Let me pause here. Jesus is Lord. Wow. 2,000 years ago in Corinth, this could have got you arrested and me arrested for saying Jesus is Lord. Why? Good question. The Romans did not care who you worshiped as long as you said Caesar was Lord. And so the Romans said, we want unity. Worship whoever you want to, but Caesar ultimately is Lord. And Jesus and his disciples have a new political emphasis called the kingdom of God. And Jesus' followers are saying, no, no, no. Jesus himself is Lord. So what did that mean? It meant that their lives were dictated and governed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Jesus, hold on now, Jesus is a good king. In the ancient world, other kings said, you must sacrifice. In Jesus' kingdom, he says, I'm the king who's going to sacrifice. And what does he sacrifice? He sacrifices his life to do what? To set you and I free from the dungeon of guilt, from the shackles of sin and the burden of shame to give us a new life. And why does he give us a new life? So that we can go, Jesus, I got a prayer answered. No, it's so that we can say, Jesus, you are Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You need to understand this. If you're new to Transformation Church, ain't no self-help here. God is not a genie in a bottle. He's not a spiritual ATM. He is a Lord, and he is a king, and he gives dictates. He gives the purpose. He gives the agenda. And here's what's beautiful. Here's what's beautiful. That's when you come alive, when you say yes to him. When you say yes to him, and you go, God, like, I double-dog dare you for a week, just say, Lord, your will be done. Watch what happens. I, I, for those of you who have kids, you remember when they were small 
and they would be entertained by the boxes at Christmas? Well, they get big and they want car keys. I often w wonder if our prayers are like boxes that we wanna kick around the house and miss the real thing because we're going, God, I want this, and God is going, I have something bigger. Now, in understand this, bigger doesn't mean the American dream. Bigger means your heart becomes big like Jesus's. Your character becomes big like Jesus's. You begin to reflect Jesus. That's the bigger. Thank you. Golf clap. There, yeah, I see you. I see you. There are different ministries, but the same Lord, and there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. So therefore, every follower of Jesus is a gift. Every follower of Jesus is a gift. That's an acronym. I know not everybody here is a follower of Jesus yet, but you got to understand this. Our king is a good king. And, and, and he's a forgiving king. He's a, he's a king who gives new life, but he's also a king who will give you new appetites and spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not something that you work for. It's something that God gives you as a gift. So, for example, some of you, for good and perhaps for bad, look like your mom and your dad. You be the judge of that. You didn't ask, I didn't ask to look this way. This is what I got as a gift of their DNA. Well, when you and I are born again, God's going, I'm gonna give you gifts for this family called the church to be expressed in the church and in the world. You are gifted. No, no, I'm talking to you. If you follow Jesus, you're gifted. And please understand this, not one gift is more important than another gift. My gift is not more important than your gifting. You are gifted. Parents, you remember when your kids were first born? And, and like every parent thinks their kid is special. Yeah. And they're gifted. Yeah. Like my child knows German <laughs> and Swahili <laughs> at seven months old. How about yours? <laughs> well, how did that happen? We put baby Einstein, that's what I did with my kids. I got the little headphones, the Walkman. Y'all young ones don't even know what a Walkman is. And I put the headphones on Vicky's stomach. That's probably why my kids don't like opera music now. <laughs> like sometimes our kids aren't that gifted. <laughs> but, you ready? But God's kids are. Amen. But God's kids are. You are gifted. Now, I don't know how your gift is going to play out, but you are gifted. Here's one of the things that um, is just my confession time. Pastoral arrogance is just so weird to me. First of all, is Jesus' gospel? What you bragging about? The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. You didn't make it up. What you, you are Jesus' people. Like, what's there to be arrogant about? If anything, it brings you to your knees. I'm trying to tell you, I am surprised as anybody that I'm a pastor, let alone a Christian. I wake up going, man, I'm actually a Christian. That's amazing. <laughs> you are gifted, friends. Check this out. Now, teenagers, listen to this. There are different gifts but the same spirit. So God, the Holy Spirit, at your moment of saying yes to Jesus, deposited a spiritual gift and our spiritual gifts in you. But here's the deal, though. Here's the deal. How do those spiritual gifts come? Not by looking for the spiritual gifts, but by letting Jesus love you, and that moves you to love people. And as a result of that, the gift begins to take place. For those of you who know my story, I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. Um, I didn't like reading books. Um, I didn't own a Bible um, I didn't attend church. I came to faith at 26. I didn't ask to be a pastor. Matter of fact, for those of you who know me from back in the day, when people said, Derwin, you should be a pastor, I was like, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> so my point is this. You don't discover your gifts by going, what's my gift, what's my gift? You discover your gifts by putting a towel around your waist and saying, who can I love and who can I serve? 
And as a result of that, your gifting will begin to come out. Not only are you gifted, oh, but you're important. And I wanna make sure we get this the right way. Let's come at it from this angle. We live in a culture that loves when people fail. Matter of fact, I've done some own private research, and I think Jerry Springer's show has shaped the United States of America. No, seriously. Late night cable TV show is Jerry Springer. ESPN now is Jerry Springer. Everybody arguing and debating, no one's making a point, is just arguing, and we love it. We too, don't act like y'all don't watch Jerry Springer and Mari Povich. You know you do. Y'all, that's why we love reality shows. MTV, I remember when the first reality show came on, it was a train wreck, and people were tuning in. Why? Because we like to see people more messed up than us. We never feel like we're good enough. We've been told we can never make it. And here's the thing. We're not good enough. Jesus is our good enough. If Jesus is not your good enough, nothing would ever be your good enough. Social media is not evil. It's what we do with it and the time we spend on it. If you are obsessing about how many likes you have, that's a problem. If you are buying fake Twitter and Instagram followers, that's a problem. You do know people do that. You can buy like 10,000 for like a couple hundred bucks. Like they're not real. But when people show up to your page like, oh, look at all you famous. No, you ain't. So, 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 so what happens is, is we validate our, our importance by the number of likes, and God is going, that doesn't make you important. There's one love that makes you important. Look to the cross. Amen. That's what makes you important. If the whole world knowing you, look, 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 let me put it light like this. If Jesus not telling you that you're important, the whole world thinking you're important is not enough. Amen. Jesus is our enough, and you are important to him. Check this out. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. So here we go. Ministries, there's different ways to articulate and to express and to display the way God has gifted you. The image that I see is like God is an artist and we are his paintbrushes and the world is his canvas and he wants to create beautifully through you and I. And what he's saying is, trust me, trust me. Um, teenagers, this is probably strange to you, but we used to have these things called radios. And there would be this station called AM and a station called FM. Well, let's flip it. AM stands for voices against me. FM stands for voice for me. We have to turn down the AM and turn up the FM. We got to turn down the voices against me and turn up the voices for me. So, Take some time off social media. Take some time to pray and listen. Let this wash over you that God is saying, listen, I've given you a gift. You matter to me. Not, not only are you gifted and important, you are a fellow minister. That's kind of a churchy word, but, but it just means this. You and I have the privilege to be partners with God in reconstructing the world. You and I have the privilege to partner with God in reconstructing the world. All of us want to be a part of something bigger. That's why I think, uh, I'll just use college football since it's college football season. That's why college football fans, that's why, you know, I mean, we just get into it because inherent within us is a desire to be a part of something that lives longer than us, that leaves a legacy. And God is going, I've made you a part of the greatest and biggest story there is. My story. 
and I want to partner with you. How does God change the world? Through people. God told a man named Noah, build a big old boat. God called a man named Abraham, I want you to go. God has always used people, why not you? Well, Derwin, you know, they're special. Really? Uh, they just like you. Oh, gosh. Man, Abraham, that dude had issues. Like, you do know that God uses people who have issues, right? You do know that God uses imperfect people, right? Because that's all he's got to work with. Let me say that again for the people in the back. You do know God uses imperfect people because that's all he has to work with. If perfection was the standard by which God would use people, then only Jesus himself would be used. Yes, amen. You have a role to play. You are a minister at your job, at your schools. Teenagers, how different would your school be if you began to see yourself as a minister of God's grace. Uh, are you tired of fickle friends directing you? Like the old church people say, you got a friend in Jesus and he'll never leave you nor forsaken you nor abandon you. You can trust him. God has made you a fellow minister. Um, that's why we have this thing called the transformation track. So all these people that you see are people who have become members of Transformation Church since 2019. Let's give God a hand. This is absolutely astonishing and amazing. Now, this Transformation Track is comprised of three classes. Know God's story. You're gonna go in God's story. You're gonna be equipped with tools, but also you're gonna discover your fit and where you have a role on the team. Teamwork truly does make the dream work. Like when you watch a sports, or, or, or if you watch a symphony, an orchestra, everybody has a role to play. You have a role to play. Years ago, uh, this is when Jeremiah was real small, was coaching uh, flag football, and there was a little boy on the team, little blonde head boy. He wasn't good. However, he was on the team, and it's not about being good. It's about the lessons you learn while you play. And so I designed a play for him to score a touchdown. It was kind of unfair. I mean, here I am, NFL experience, coaching against these other, you know, dudes, but <laughs> it's competition. <laughs> so I'm developing the play for the little blonde boy to score, and I was like, okay, son, here's the play. Are you ready to score? He goes, no. And I said, no, 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 I'm going to give you the ball, and this is going to be a take. He goes, no, I don't want the ball. I don't want to score. And then he grabbed my leg, right? So I just hugged him because he was kind of afraid, and somebody else had to score the touchdown. God's saying, are you ready to score? Are you ready to get in the game? Because I've drawn up the play. I've gifted you. Now, here's where the story breaks down. Go ahead and grab God's leg. Go ahead and hold on to him, because when you recognize you can't, that's when he can. Amen. I'm not sure who this is for, but some of us are overconfident, and it ain't in God, it's in ourselves. Some of us are overconfident. Well, I know the Bible. So? The devil knows the Bible. Are you kind? Are you forgiving? Are you loving? Like, don't be over, well, I will never, never say what you'll never do. You say, if not by the grace of God, there go I. Right. Amen. Fellow ministers, Transformation Track is coming up in November. Check this out now. Teenagers, look at this. And there are different activities. Man, this right here, this right here is pregnant with divine potential. Man, I don't know what this means for you, but whoa, my goodness, what an adventure. But, but, the same God produces each gift in each person. Listen, if God wanted you to be somebody else, he wouldn't have made you. If God wanted you to have somebody else's gifts, he wouldn't have made you. Sometimes we don't recognize what we have because we're recognizing what other people have. 
We're going, well, I want that gift. And God is going, no, that's not the gift I want for you. Let me tell you another story. It just popped in my head. I, I think I've shared this before. Uh, if you've heard it before, just act like you haven't. <laughs> I'm coaching flag football again. Got a little guy on the team named Max. Uh, Max is gifted with kindness. Maybe not the most athletic at that time. However, we had a role for him on the team. We're playing flag football, and I said, Max, this is your job. Your job is to cover the center. That's the guy who hikes, hikes the ball. I said, your job is to cover him, and by the end of this game, you will get an interception. I promise you. Okay, Pastor Darwin. But his teammates were just making plays everywhere, getting interceptions, scoring touchdowns. He was so mad at me. He's like, I want to play another position, but I know the position that was best for him. Halftime, man, he goes sitting on his mama lap. He's looking at me all mad. <laughs> I don't care at all. Zero feelings. <laughs> I know what's best for you. Trust me. So anyway, we're still playing a game. He's doing what I'm telling. He's begrudgingly doing what I'm asking him to do. Right before the game is over, he's guarding the player I told him to guard. He catches the football. And he runs all the way down the field. He intercepts it, and he scores a touchdown. So I'm behind him, and I just turn on. This is when I could run without pulling hamstrings. I turned on. Man, I outran all those eight-year-old kids. I don't care. I ran all those kids, and I met him in the end zone, right? And when he scored, all his teammates grabbed him. They were jumping on him. I didn't grab them. And I said, Max, I'm so proud of you. And I said, listen, the same way you trusted me, I want you to trust God. God knows best. Even when everybody else is shining, God has for you what he has for you. So I want to tell you right now, don't look at somebody else's marriage. Don't look at what college somebody else got to. Don't look at what job they got. What God has for you, God has for you. Trust him. He's got gifts that he wants to express through you. The aim of God the Holy Spirit's gifts is not the elevation of a person, but the health of the church. It's not the elevation of a person, it's the health of a church. When I say church, it's not this building, it's us as a people, it's your families, it's you going into your workspaces. Let's look at some gifts. This isn't all the gifts. If you wanna have a more in-depth understanding of God the Holy Spirit, I did a series called uh, God the Spirit, you can find it on our website. It's more in depth. But, but here's just a little taste. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for what? The common good. Hold on, let me read. It's given to each person so one of them can become a rock star. So the congregation can become their fan club. No, for the common good. To, to one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. What is wisdom? In the Greek, wisdom is Sophia. Uh, it means the skill to live life. So there are people who've been gifted with the skill to live life. They're, they're wise, they're mature. In other words, you want to surround yourself with those kinds of people. Teenagers, birds of a feather flock together. Everybody, if you want to know where you're going, look at your five closest friends. We want to surround ourselves with wise people to make wise decisions. Young moms, young moms, hear me carefully. This is so important. If you have like a five-year-old, getting advice from another mom who has a five-year-old is mm, not the smartest thing to do. What's she know that you don't know? You need to find you a woman with some gray hair <laughs> who got grandkids and go, can you help me please? Because they might know something. It's called wisdom. They've experienced Life. That's why we want our TC groups integrated. What's another 48-year-old going to tell me? I need somebody that's older and wiser like Alan to give me wisdom. People with wisdom hairs, we need you. Amen. You don't retire, you refire. Amen. We need you. We want you. Just because our culture doesn't value age, we're going to value age here. That's why we're called multi-generational, because your wisdom matters to us. 
and we can teach you how to do Instagram. To another, a message of knowledge by the same spirit. Message of knowledge, these are people who have incredible knowledge about Jesus. They don't have to be a pastor on staff. There's people who love Jesus and they can break it down and make it explainable. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same spirit. There are some people, like my wife has the gift of faith. When I'm breaking down and panicking, she's like, we good? I'm like, no. She's like, no, no, we are. Okay. There are some people with the gift of healing that God does heal, that there are times where God will step out of eternity and touch the present. But we know healing's guaranteed. It's called the resurrection. Sometimes God gives us previews of that. To another, the performing of miracles. There are people who are gifted to do that from time to time. To another, prophecy. Primarily in the New Testament, prophecy is saying, here's what God's word says, as in the Bible. But there are times where people can give you insight about yourself or something that's gonna take place. However, you don't live by that. If it comes to pass, great. If it doesn't, you got the word of God. This is back in 2005. I'm at Willow Creek Church in Chicago. I'm in a bookstore. I'm reading books. I like books. Books are my friends. I'm having a good time by myself. A black pastor from Saginaw, Michigan comes up to me while I'm reading a book. He says, hey, how you doing? I'm going, hi, I'm reading a book. (laughs) He continues and persists to talk to me. In the midst of his interruption, he says, "Uh, are you a pastor? I said, nope, and never going to be one. He's like, no, 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 you will be a pastor. He goes, there are going to be thousands of people who are going to follow Jesus because of God's gifting in you. I can hear it in your voice. I can see it in you. I was like, would you leave me alone now? That's what I'm saying in my mind. Anyway, 20 minutes go by. We're in worship, and I literally hear his voice saying, you're going to be a pastor. I ran out of the auditorium just crying. I called Vicky on the phone. I said, honey, I think, I think, I think I'm supposed to be a pastor. She was just silent because she didn't want me to do that either. And I, and, and I said, okay, if this is God, then you'll get confirmation of this because we don't move unless we're in agreement. So that actually happened. But there's been some people to tell me some other stuff that ain't ever happened. So the point is, the word of God guides you but also have discernment because there could be some encouragement along the way. To another, distinguishing spirits, they have discernment to know what's true doctrine, what's false doctrine. To another, different kinds of tongues. There are some people who have prayer languages where where they pray. That doesn't mean you're better or worse than. That's just a gift that, that you have. To another, interpretation of tongues. They can hear somebody praying and interpret those tongues. And one and the same spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. So what's the point in this? Here's, here's the point. We have a good king, and he wants you and I to experience his kingdom, but he wants the world to experience the kingdom beginning with us as a family, in your families, in your jobs, and out throughout the world. And he goes, I'm gonna give you the grace and the gifting to make that happen. I want you to marinate on this song, and afterwards I'll be back out to close this in prayer. sing is the life that we live and the way that we love one another. Let's sing this together.
together. Father, we want to bring you glory. We want to bring you honor. We thank you that you give us the grace to even desire that, but to accomplish that. You gave us grace by inviting us into your kingdom through your son, Jesus, and you gave us grace gifts to display your kingdom through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we rest in your presence, as we soak in your grace. That's when our gifts are set ablaze because it's an extension of your love into the world. At work, at school, at play, whatever it is that we do, we've been gifted for ministry. Ministry in the house called TC and mission outside of TC into the world. Woman, boy, girl, child, whoever calls upon the name of Jesus as Lord has the power of the Spirit. I want to pray for those of you who are saying, hey, preacher, there's some things I heard, and I hear clearly that I need to recognize Jesus as Lord, not as um, just someone I occasionally talk to, but as God, as King, my, my forgiver, the one who gives me a new life, the one who buries my shame and my guilt in his empty tomb, the one who bled to forever forgive me. The one who rose again to give me new life through the power of the Spirit to make me a part of this new family. Today, I'm ready to claim you, Jesus, as Lord. Today's the day. Right now is the moment. Tomorrow's not guaranteed, but this moment is. And in this moment, Jesus, with his nail-pierced hands, are extended to you. He's calling you by name. In the silence of your heart, if that's you, you're ready to follow him. Say this to him. Today, Lord Jesus, I bow my knee, I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that you died in my place, that you extended me grace. I'm forever forgiven, and through the resurrection on the third day, I now share in your life. I'm now part of your people. I'm now indwelt by your spirit. I am now gifted. I can't earn it, I can't achieve it. It's so precious, I could only receive it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and God's people said, amen. Can we give God a round of applause?